Today, I want to continue a discussion that uh, we began a week or two ago when we began discussing, we finished the first book, the Samadhipada, and the second one, uh, Sadhanapada. And in that very first sloka of that second book of Patanjali, there's a reference to, I'll read it here, uh, accepting pain is purification. In other words, uh, is one of the practices of yoga. And that sort of sounds a little unpleasant, <laughs> accepting pain is purification. But actually, in a sense, you could say living in duality, just living in this world of Maya is painful in a sense that uh, there's pleasure, there's pain, there's suffering. We live in a world of suffering. And I don't mean to say that morbidly, but the fact of the matter is anything outside of God is you, ignorance. Anything outside of God is is a lack of bliss and there's discontent in that. And that discontent, all of these, you might say, painful experiences in life, the suffering that comes to in life, they act as a spur to drive us on to find what we truly, really want, which is that freedom of the soul in God. And so the practice of yoga is learning to overcome and to transcend uh, uh, these suffering of the world. And isn't this exactly what Paramahansa Yogananda said? Everybody in this world is motivated for two, two principles, the search for happiness and the avoidance of suffering. So consequently, you could say it sums up that process by which we do that. And one of those you could say is learning to be able to transcend pain and deal with it and or and so i used it i was saying i expanded that to say how do we face you know things come to us uh and you know why do in our karma comes to us everything is karmically you could say there's some reason behind cause and effect and why do we sometimes say oh we avoid I've raised the question of how to face our karma. Well, why don't we face our karma? Why might we not want to face our karma? And I think the basic reason is, well, it's painful sometimes. <laughs> it's There's suffering involved in that, and we don't want to, oh, no. And we classify karma, which really is neutral in its essence, but we classify it as good. Karma is coming because it's going to be pleasant. Something pleasant is coming down the road. Or... We might classify it as, oh, it's bad karma, which is another way of saying it's going to be painful or it's going to induce unpleasantness or suffering. And so how do we face that? And I thought about this as I was, I was, uh, I want to share some thoughts about this. And uh, this, a chant came to mind and I asked Bara, our techie here, behind the scenes. There he is up on the screen. I asked him to play because he's, uh, he's a better musician and singer than I am. And uh, I asked him to play this chant and to share this chant because uh, you'll, you'll see as we go along today how this uh, relates to what we're talking about today. So go ahead, Bara, and I leave it to you. Thank you, Jayaji. Teresa of Avila's admonition, this is called. Let nothing disturb you, nothing affright you, all things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory, once you have God, you'll want nothing more. God alone, God alone, God alone, so we ever need. God alone, God alone, God alone, so we ever need. Let nothing disturb you, nothing affright you, all things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory once you have God. You'll want nothing more. God. 
Thank you, Barra. That was that was fantastic. That was very, very, very nice. So let's take that thought. Let's take that thought into our discussion today. Uh, I know a lady. Am I, I uh, some? I know a someone. Let me. I should say that. And actually, I know a lot of someones uh, who are quite sensitive. And by that, and I oftentimes people are sensitive to a lot of things and sometimes spiritually sensitive. But in this one person that I know I'm thinking of, but I could expand it to many different ways, different people, is extremely sensitive to heat and cold. And, uh, you know, if it's a little bit above a comfort level, she gets very disturbed, you know, it's, oh, Oh God, I can't stand it. So it's so hot in here today or so, you know, in the office, perhaps you're working in the office and got to turn that air conditioner up and it gets just a little bit below the comfort level. Uh, oh, it's so cold in here, you know, and and if you out in the midst of daily activity, very, very sensitive. And I then began to notice this person is also very sensitive to a lot of different things, aches and pains and the, a lot of things and having to do with the physical environment. And uh, I've noticed this in many people that people tend to be very sensitive to different things. And some people perhaps are sensitive to all of them, you know, because it's to some degree, if you're sensitive to one thing, you'll be sensitive to other things, perhaps too, there's a connection. And because some of it is physical, but it's also, you might say, emotional, it's mental. You notice how some people, they can't stand th certain things in their environment. Uh, they can't stand certain sounds, sights. They can't stand certain types of people, uh, you know, people, other people's beliefs or attitudes. And, you know, there's prejudices involved. People don't like certain personalities. So it's more than just the physical environment is where I was originally starting with. But there's a lot of things you could say there's their thermostat, their internal thermostat is very, very sensitive. And when it goes outside of a very narrow spectrum, uh, they don't like it. They they're uncomfortable. And you could say they experience pain and they experience suffering. They experience reaction to it. And actually, it, it, we may not think of it as suffering and pain, but it really is. And to the degree that 
it forces them to react in a certain way. And they're very uncomfortable in the in a in a situation like that. And you know, there's many. And so, what does a person do when they're like that? The common reaction, because I suspect, although all of us, most of us, I don't think are super sensitive to everything, but we probably all of us have our certain elements that uh, disturb us, you know, in some way. And that St. Therese says, let nothing disturb you. And because we are, we're being disturbed. We live in this world and it's full of disturbances. And we, the natural, you could say, isn't it just human? Isn't it just natural to be able to fix those disturbances? So, ah, oh, everything's comfortable. Everything's nice. But we know from a little bit of experience that everything being nice is not going to stay that way because our thermostat, then something is going to change and we're going to have to continually readjust, readjust, readjust and restless. And so in a sense, you, this is what karma is like. Karma is, although I say it's master said, if karma is neutral, we make it good or bad according to our reaction to it. But this is karma's coming. And, and you could say that now it's hot, now it's cold is our karma. It's now it's hot, now it's cold. What do we do? And the typical thing is, you know, I think the first thing that comes to mind with people is, well, I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to do a roundabout and get around it. And somehow, I, if I can outsmart it, maybe uh, it will go away. But we know from experience that if it's our karma, it sooner it it, yes, it may have just been momentary and we we do get away from it. But on the other hand, there's always some price to pay in life and we can't avoid it. And certain larger things are our karma and it's our karma to be a certain do certain duties in life. And oh, I'm going to avoid them, but it won't. Life doesn't allow us to avoid for very long. It finds us and when it finds us, and we have to finally come usually to be successful to overcome that karma. We have to confront it. We have to face it. So avoidance, although sometimes temporarily successful, uh, eventually we have to maybe do something about it, get to the root of it. I have uh, occasionally every once in a while, I have uh, spasms in my back, back spasms, and, you know, the, any muscle spasms. And if any of you have had that, you know, very uncomfortable. And so if I've got to go, I've got to do something and I can, you know, oh, it's really bad. Maybe I take some ibuprofen and that allows me to go forward and get whatever the task is at hand to complete it. But I know that's not really the, it's only a temporary ameliorates the pain for temporary and eventually I have to do something a little bit better to let it, you know, to overcome it. And sometimes that something is just rest. I have to do that. But so, yes, we can do something temporary, but perhaps there's something deeper at fault and you have bodily aches and pains or maybe a symptom of something deeper that we have to get to the root of rather than just avoiding it. And so their avoidance is not, it can be a temporary solution. You know, it's like Swami always used to talk about going to the dentist and you can take Novocaine and he didn't take Novocaine. And I take, <laughs> I tried the non Novocaine route a few times, but it's, you know, more than I want to put up with. So I, I take the Novocaine. So it's a, but I know it's a temporary avoidance, but yet, you know, there's lots of things in life that we temporarily avoid, but it doesn't overcome it. But there are some things that you really, they're ongoing karmas that we have to face. And so we know the avoidance isn't necessarily the best solution often, or rarely it, it is it. But uh, so what else can we do? Well, there's a number of things I was thinking, what do we do when karma, how do we face our karma? Well, you can avoid it. You can endure it. You can rise above it. And you can get to the root of it and try to fix whatever it is that's causing that. And there may be some others, but those are the basic ones. And if we, it, uh, so let's avoid, let's go beyond avoidance. That's not so much. 
what about endurance? And there's something to be said uh, for endurance. And there is a, and it's what I wanted to focus a little bit on today. And there's a practice in yoga known, which you might know this word, uh, tatiksha. It's patient endurance is what you could say, what uh, St. Teresa was saying. Uh, let nothing disturb you, let nothing affright you. All things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance leads one to victory. Once one you have God, you'll want nothing more. What is this patient endurance? Now, I'm not talking about grim endurance, or I'm not talking about, I'm going to just tough it out, you know, and, and uh, endure this intolerable pain. I'm not really speaking about that, but I, it's, but it's a patient endurance. Uh, and it's being able to, you could say, be indifferent, learn to be indifferent. And this is a ancient, uh, you might say even a, a essential to some degree practice of yoga. Shankara, Adi Shankara, many, many, many centuries ago, said, defined it, he says, endurance of all afflictions without countering aids and without anxiety or lament is said to be titiksha. Countering without lament or anxiety, indifference, in other words, to the opposites of this world, pleasure, pain, indifference, heat or cold, reward or punishment, gain and loss, praise and blame, birth, death, you know, no birth, no death, comfort, discomfort, affection, bereavement, all of these things that, that go on is learning to be able to remain centered and calm within ourselves. And it, and this is the, this is the test. If we're practicing Tatiksha successfully, it should lead one to becoming even minded and cheerful in all circumstances. So if somebody asks the question, well, how do you become even minded? Because Paramahansa Yogananda used to recommend this. He says, be even minded and cheerful in all circumstances. And one of the ways to do that is through this practice of Tatiksha. It's a practice which we consciously undertake in order to not allow the world outside of ourselves to pull us off center. And so, yes, eventually the best way to do that is to rise above it, rise our consciousness beyond this physical world. And this is, of course, what the goal is. One of the ways to avoid pain is to transcend it in our love for God, our, our, our ability to concentrate and go beyond it. But we have to remember, we don't start there. We have to also take an approach to be able to not toughen ourselves up a little bit joyfully, you see. Now, to do it in the sense of, you know, to, like to go to the dentist and not take Novocaine is probably too much. It's usually too much for me. Uh, and so it, I can't do that joyfully. I can't do that even semi-positively very easily. Uh, I have done it a few times just to discipline myself, but I say, you know, there's other things in life I'd rather put my energy on rather than this. And so consequently, it has to be you have to do it to some sense of with internal positiveness, positive attitude, but it's a good thing to practice. And I don't mean it simply, you see, to leave it just on the physical level, you say, oh, okay, I, I'm not too keen on that, but let's take it beyond the physical because the Tiksha applies also to the emotional reactions, the influence that circumstances have upon us, and we can't be apathetic and it's not a matter of being dull and but it it's the said to be traditionally the first step to being able to interiorize the mind to bring the various reactions to what happened in our life under control for example you're trying to meditate and you feel a little 
on your maybe on on your arm or on your leg you feel a little itch okay you scratch the itch okay now you try to sit meditate oh gosh there's a little noise outside uh, uh, the room okay oh close the window okay now the noise is gone oh, oh you know it's a little cold in here I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the heat on a little bit oh that didn't you know that didn't work you know maybe you know it's it's a little bit uh the, the candle is flickering so now i adjust the wick on the on and on and on it goes little things begin to disturb us and we react because we're so sensitive you know through our senses to what's going on and we have to come to a point of firm and say no i'm not gonna move i'm gonna keep my i'm gonna keep my mind at the point between the eyebrows and then when we discipline ourselves to that degree, these little circumstances of the world begin to recede. So Tatiksha applies on all these levels. You go and, and there's this person in the office who just irritates you, just irritates you. So to the point where you just can't stand anymore, you have to leave. I remember there was a one of the fellow disciples of uh, Swami Kriyananda in the ashram when he was a disciple, Master was alive in that time. So his name was Norman, Brother Norman. And Swamiji was a, you know, a good friend of, you know, they were friends as brother disciples. And so, you know, Brother Norman, there was another disciple that was, he couldn't stand this other person. And there was a, uh, he just couldn't stand him because he had a personality that was very grating and very irritating. And for that reason, and probably other reasons as well, he ended up leaving the ashram and going off on his own. He couldn't get along in that way or take it. And then some months later, Norman went out and he got a job and uh, came back to visit the ashram and, and visited uh, Swamiji at that time and said to Swamiji, he says, you know, so-and-so who I couldn't get along with, I just couldn't stand him. Well, in my new job, I've got six guys just like that. <laughs> and he had to learn that lesson. And so, so Tatiksha is being able to ride those waves to be able to, to be able to endure you might say, not just the, emo the physical, but the emotional, the temperamental, the mental, the environmental circumstances in general. And actually, in terms of meditation, Tatiksha is said to be one of the practices to practice Tatiksha is to meditate. It's said is to meditate and watch the breath. It's just put, put the mind on the breath and just watching the breath. And so, so here when you're meditating, you're so restless, you can't sit still. It's you're allowing you, you, the mind to be diverted. This to actually is to practice our techniques, practice Hong Sa. But it has to be to take you in whatever, whether it's in meditation or whatever. It just can't be left at the level of grim endurance. It means to practice and, uh, in a joyful manner. And it means to be detached eventually. You ultimately to be able to detach oneself from those things that are pulling us out and to transcend them. And but we have to start in small ways. I mean, the big things come. We can't detach ourselves if pain and suffering at at times when you know that are too much for us. We have to uh, we have to take all sorts of means where. We, you know, if we expect to just jump into a situation and overcome it or transcend it, it's, it's too much. We have to start small. And there's a story of Master when he was uh, with the monks there at Mount Washington. They were moving, and he was helping with the monks, working with them in landscaping in Mount Washington. And they had a wishing well, concrete wishing well, and they were repositioning the wishing well, and Master was there working with them, helping them do this, and they dropped it, and it fell right on Master's foot, and it broke his foot, uh, and this, this wishing well was like maybe 250 kg, 
So it was really, imagine having that fall on your foot and breaking it. And he was able to, and when that happened, everybody gasped, oh my gosh. And Master saw this happen. He said, now this is a good opportunity to, a lesson can be learned here. It's fallen on his foot. And uh, he said, this is a painful experience. Now, let me demonstrate here. I'm going to put my consciousness in the physical body. And he put his consciousness in the physical body. And they could see immediately his face began to contort and they could just see the pain of what it might be. Imagine this heavy thing breaking your uh, breaking your foot. And he says, now I will put my mind in the superconscious and transcend this physical body. And he would, he put his eyebrow eyes up and went into a, a super conscious state. And they saw immediately total calm, total equanimity on his face, joyfulness on his face. And then he would do this. He went back into the body, his consciousness lowered and back a few times. And all the monks, Swamiji said he wasn't there for that experience, but all the monks related, they were, it was striking. And they said it really had an impact upon all of them to see the, ability to go up and down uh, from that pain. Now, this is not something we can immediately do. It's something we have to start at a lower level. I remember I used to practice this and maybe sometimes I still do a little uh, when I was, but I remember younger when uh, I was in my 20s and 30s. Uh, we would go me and other fellows at the ashram would we'll go and do various jobs. Sometimes the jobs would be away from Ananda village and we would ride there and it would be, sometimes it'd be in the winter time and there would be a group of us, maybe four or five of us in the, the car. And somebody would roll the window down and it was cold outside. Maybe it was freezing outside. And the temptation would be for somebody to say, Hey, roll the window up, man, it's that's really cold in here. And that was my thinking anyway. And I thought, no, I'm not going to be the first one to say it's cold in here. I'll let, uh, I'll let somebody else be cold first and I'll just let it be. And I would do that. And then somebody else would finally say, hey, gee, it's really cold. Can you roll the window up? But then after a while, because these young fellows, we were all of like mind in some ways, they wouldn't say anything either. And so we'd be going along and it became something of a game to see who could endure the cold long, the longest before somebody would actually say, roll that window up. Now, this is silly in some ways, but anyway, it was a bit of a game to just say, OK, I can endure this unpleasant situation. It's like those sadhus at the Kumbha Mela who sit in the hot sun and put those fires around themselves just to endure, learn to endure and go transcend just as a discipline, you might say. Now, generally, I would say, you know, we don't have to invite suffering in our life in order to discipline ourselves, uh, you know, because Divine Mother is going to give us all the tests we need. We don't need to go inviting them purposefully like that. But nevertheless, sometimes these things uh, can be a game. And so necessary, don't necessarily always be the first one to complain because it's a little bit too cold. Don't be like that person who's so sensitive. I mentioned right at the beginning, so sensitive that they become the human thermostat. Oh, they'd be running up, turning it, turning it up, turning it down. This too, Will pass, you might say, as an as a motto to keep in mind. This too will pass. All difficulties, all trials, all sufferings. To get upset, to to alter our actions to in response to minor irritations in life, whether it be other people. Pull us off center is what it is. Why allow something to pull you out of your inner peace and to be, just to be able to allow it to happen to or as Swamiji used to say that which comes of itself, let it come and detach yourself from it a little bit. But this does take a certain amount of practice. And if we can do it consciously in one way, we find that we begin to do it in other ways as well. You know, I've mentioned this before, not to 
long ago about traveling a lot and different diets people have. Not be too fussy, you know. If if uh, you're in if you're in your own home, of course you can be fussy all you want. But if you're at somebody's house and they're serving you something, let it be. If you're in somebody's house and maybe they got a little music playing in the background, you don't like the music, but it's their house, and so why let it disturb you? Or uh, you know somebody seemingly wanting to entertain you, you know, is entertains you is something that really is not very entertaining. Why complain? Just let it be and go with the flow. In other words, don't be don't be so reactive to what's happened. Food, other people, circumstances, and maintain that sense of neutrality to overcome pain and suffering and dislikes. And this is what is known as the practice of this is tatiksha applies to pleasant sensations as well. Now, I'm just listing here the unpleasant ones, but really tatiksha also is when pleasant things come into our life. Don't get all excited. Just say, okay, just observe. Okay, but this is going to pass. Now, I'm not saying be a wet blanket. Uh, you know, something happens and you, other people are joyful and you kind of, you know, you're sort of a... a downer, you know, somebody who uh, is going to sort of bring the energy of the group down. I'm not saying to do that, but enjoy, but in yourself, remain a certain amount of dispassion and detachment. This too is going to pass. And you develop in this process an impersonal report, uh, 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 more of an impersonal approach to life. But the measure here is the development of inner calmness and joy, cheerfulness, cheerful in all circumstances, even-minded and cheerful in all circumstances. And this is a measure that we're practicing in the right spirit, because in the end, true tatiksha, the reason for practicing is just not just to, you know, toughen ourselves up, but it leads to a, this detachment from these outer vicissitudes of life, the good and the bad, leads to, a, leads to a state of inner calm. And eventually, it leads to that. It's an indifference to whatever happens outside, but not a deadening indifference. You, in other words, whatever comes, you're going to deal with it and enjoy it. It ultimately leads to transcendence, a sense of freedom. And this is what we're after. We're after freedom in life. Nothing can touch me. I am free. I am free. Whatever comes, nothing can touch me. I am free. And this is this is the practice. And I think it's a healthy practice. It can be taken to extremes. You know, the sadhus who hold the arm up. Uh, and Swamiji talks about meeting such a sadhu. And because, but generally, it's not a something we recommend, but it's an old traditional practice of this uh, tapasya, that sort of thing, inducing some sort of discomfort or unpleasantness, which I don't think is, is necessary. Let Divine Mother bring what she's going to bring. But even there, Swami said he met that person, although he didn't particularly uh, endorse those practices. And this one fellow, he said, the fellow was suffused with joy. And he said, well, the proof is in the pudding, you might say. He, the joy is the measure, the trans obvious transcendency of one from body consciousness and replacing that with a sense of joy is the measure of whether something is working or it's not working for one. But nevertheless, in practicing in little ways, you'll find that like the meditation, if one can, and, and the and the the restlessness that is induced by oversensitivity, you find with a little bit of self discipline practice, you can keep that body still. And the thing is, then the world stops bothering you. <laughs> it's what as long as you're so over really oversensitive to it, it's going to keep bothering you, and you're never going to be able to be a rest, a rest, calm. The opposite of restless. 
whether it's in emotions, physical, physicality, mental, all of these things, you have to get to that point where you can transcend, but do it joyfully, do it joyfully in that way. And so with that, I'm going to look in the chat box, see if we have it, something. Is it possible that at times a karma is bigger than we can handle? Yes, there are times, and, and I'm going to, I should get, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. Or it may be out of our power to change it in any meaningful way, especially when it comes to karma with other people. And we just have to wait for it to pass. Exactly. But of course, it takes a certain discipline to wait for it to pass. Things, let it pass. That which everything passes, this too shall pass away. There is to be a certain amount of that, but that takes a certain strength to be able to do that and also not lose your peace of mind and to be able to do that. And that's not really avoidance. You can't do anything. It's patient endurance. If you can do it patiently and calmly and joyfully, that's what we have to do to a certain, bit, a certain extent. But the first part of that question, which is a very good question, is, uh, uh, is it possible that at times karma is bigger than we can handle? And yes, it is. And I go back to Swami and his, his uh, uh, dentistry story or end of life, you know, some, you know, the, the pain is so great that it's, it's very common, you know, person at the end of life, they can't stand the pain. And people, you know, they give pain relief to people at times to be able to uh, uh, to be, go through that suffering. Don't a person says, Oh, I'm I shouldn't do this. You know, we have to be appropriate. We and be recognize our limitations. That which takes us beyond our capacity, you could say we don't have the ability to transcend right now yet. And so consequently we if something's painful, uh we we take pain medication in order to be able to do that. Now I like or I use my taking ibuprofen, you have a headache or you have a back, back spasms. I could say, well, I should just toughen it out. But I, I have to, you have to make a certain balance in life of what you can stand and what you can't stand in order to do other things also in life. But on the other hand, I say, ideally, I would be able to transcend this and deal with this. And so I toughen myself up a little bit joyfully. And the practice of Tatiksha is learning to endure the vicissitudes of outer life and I'll not allow them to dictate my inner joy, not take away my inner joy. And there comes a point, well, well I can't take that anymore. And so I have to then back off. But then next time, maybe I'll go a little more, a little better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And so that to the point where I basically, I'm being able to transcend that. I'm being able to, I'm being able to be, and really what, what helps in that is not so much focusing on those things that are giving you, and one of the secrets, of course, of transcendence is to be so engrossed and put your mind so elevated on something positive, joyful to loving you're in joy. When there's in joy, everything else recedes. And so to the degree, when we meditate, when we practice Kriya Yoga, we practice spiritual techniques, we learn to experience that joy in a favorable situation. You see, I'm when I meditate, I'm practicing to be calm and even minded in a uh, controlled situation, a favorable situation, so that when I'm in my daily life, when, I, when I'm in daily activity and things assail me, life assails me, I can maintain it. So, constant, so meditation is not just for the quietness of your meditation room. It's training yourself to be able to experience a joyful feeling, a joyful state of consciousness so that you can recall that state at a moment's notice. In every situation, I'm calm, I'm centered, God is with me. And of course, this is to be able to have that state of mind in any circumstances is what we're speaking about why 
we have God, to be able to have God's presence with us and to live in that consciousness, then nothing can touch you. And this is at the root of that statement that Paramahansa Yogananda made. He says, when you are in Om, nothing can touch you. And that's what we're, we have to practice though. In many, and Tatiksha is one of those traditional yoga practices. That's, some people don't like it, but it is useful. And so I recommend you try it, see. Uh, is, is spiritual progress possible after death also? Uh, as in Sri Yukta, in the A.Y. Sri Yukteswar mentioned, or do you be in the Himalaya or Hiranyaloka helping the souls? Yes, it is possible after, after death. This is a little off topic, but nevertheless, it's a decent question. It's, it is possible after death, spiritual progress. But that said, it depends on one's level of consciousness. And for most people who have a great deal of physical karma, this physical plane is said to be better than the astral plane because you can't work out the physical karma so easily or at all even on the causal or the astral plane. The physical karma that comes to us is we're here in this plane because we have the karma appropriate to this plane. And so, yes, there are elements of our being and our karma that are on the astral plane as well. But the fact that we're here on this plane indicates that this is the primary sorts of karma that are more necessary for us to transcend now. So, yes, the answer is yes. But, and there's so many things in life are like that. And, uh, but yes, once, you know, once you have transcended this, you then have to transcend that astral karma. And as you make reference here of Sri Yukteswar and Hiranyaloka, you have to be able to transcend those, those causal karmas as well. Uh, but I think our focus right now is from where we are, is these karmas associated with the plane upon which uh, we exist right now. So let's move on. We're going to move on and in future weeks and we'll, and uh, so I'll leave it at that for this week. So God bless all of you. And if you can take a little bit of these lessons into your daily meditation, please let it be so and go deep into your meditation so that you can ultimately experience that inner joy that the masters speak of. Joy to you. God bless.